versus what instead of the same. Amazon's so they should be for I can handle it if I turn my head in a One more minute, let people trickle in, and we're going to get started. <coughs> um, also, Aaron, if you can let me know, if you could log into that stream and see. Yeah. <coughs> as far as I can tell, I, th I think it looks good. I'm watching it up here, too. Did you get the chance to watch the first one? Not yet. Okay. Yeah, good. Stream's up? Yep. All right. I do. Yeah. All right, about 15 more seconds, we'll get started and let anybody else trickle in. Although I think we have practically everybody. <coughs> Thank you for coming to this study session for the AWS Certified Developer <coughs> Bootcamp. Um, we're going to pick up off of where we left yesterday. Uh, we were talking about lifecycle policies in S3. So uh, before I begin, does anybody have any questions, things they might have reviewed, anything that they wanted to throw out there before I get started? Once, twice, okay, yeah. Uh, were you later going to have some kind of example or case of I don't have any examples, but I can get back to you. I'll let me do some digging in that to give you more of a real world example, okay. um, and I'll get back to you on that. Thank you. So the question was, uh, would there be a further example on Active Directory Federation? And I will do some digging and see if I can find any uh, videos or any other material that will help with that. Any other questions? All right, let's get started. So S3, we talked yesterday about S3 being the object-based storage service for Amazon. We talked a little bit about the different tiers. So we have S3 standard, we have infrequently accessed, we have reduced redundancy, and we have Glacier. So these four uh, storage <coughs> types play a role in lifecycle policies. So lifecycle policies are a subservice of S3 that allow users to store uh, I'm sorry, to move a type of storage based on time. So for instance, I may load a file into um, S3 standard. And after a while, uh, let's use the example of the uh, doctor's office. I've seen my patient. I don't expect to see them back in. Uh, they may have canceled with me. Uh, I don't expect that I need to access their record uh, quickly and often. So I moved their file over to infrequent access. So I'm saving money because I've moved it to infrequent access. It's still highly available and still highly durable, but I'm not paying the cost for standard. And then maybe later down the road I say, I want to transition over to Glacier. So let's actually switch over to the camera. And let's talk about this. 
So we have R, and this is S3 life cycle policies. All right, we have an object, and this is our health record. All right, so this record is, when we put it into S3, is S3 standard. Now let's say, so let's move our, our actual life cycle down here. This is our S3 standard. We want to move this after a month, so after 30 days. Let's put that same object, transfer it from S3 standard over into it frequently accessed. I think this is a difference of about two cents. So we have about uh, six cents per gig here. Move it over to something that's four cents per gig. I mean, I know we're big spending here, but after, you know, after you're moving a lot of data, that, that can save you some money. All right, so we haven't needed it. The user hasn't come back, or the <coughs> patient has not come back in for another consultation or visit for compliance reasons. We're gonna move it from 30 days from that to Glacier. Okay? So now, after 60 days from our original move in, into S3, and 30 days after our move into and frequently accessed, we can move it over into Glacier for long-term storage. And let's say that we have a final policy for after seven years, delete. So we are offloading the need to manage this life cycle to S3 itself. So S3 will handle this based on the policies that we create. So it includes the delete. Yes, yeah, so you can add a delete as well to your life cycle policy. Okay, so life cycle policies. Move an object in S3 to different storage classes based on the life cycle rules. Objects in S3 standard can be moved and frequently accessed. 30 days after they've been created, so 30 days after uh, S3 standard, you can move it into IA. Objects in IA, they can be moved to Glacier 30 days from that transition to IA. So 60 days from the initial creation <coughs> in S3 standard, it can be moved over to Glacier for long-term storage. Questions? Yeah. Is that a is that a requirement or is that just uh, best practices type of thing? The 30 days from standard to IA and 30 days from IA to Glacier are um, rules imposed by Amazon. Oh, okay. That's good to know. Yeah. Is Question. it by creation date or last access date? Because if you've got somebody that you're continually seeing, you don't want to get them moved to Glacier because you still want that person still in the standard. So the question was, is that those dates from the creation or the last frequently accessed time, correct? Last access. Got okay. Last access. So from what I understand, this is minimum from creation <coughs> that Amazon lets you. So this is your, your minimum bar to, for the transition over. You can write policies differently. These are just the minimums. So when you write parts that override this, you can only override more like, for example, 30 days change to 45 days, but you can change to 15 days. Correct. You cannot go under the 30 days. So you can have 45 days. You can have a year. You could say, I want it in S3 standard for a year, and then move it over into frequently accessed. But, but minimum. Yep, minimum is 30 days. Yeah. Good question. If you're accessing something that's in Glacier, can it then get moved back into standard? Go so, the other way, is there a policy for that? So the question is, can you write a policy to move something from Glacier back to S3 standard? Mm -hmm. uh, you can trigger that, but I don't believe that's done through lifecycle policies. So that is doable, but that is something that you have to enact. Uh, I thought I saw another question. Is your seven years something you made up, or is that a minimum too? The seven years in this example, the question was, is the seven years made up, or is it um, part of the policy? It's made up. I. I'm using that as a, an example for compliance reasons. Yeah. We use 10. Does the method you use to address that file change as it's moving, or do you still call it the same thing and AWS knows to go get it wherever it is? 
So are you telling like the file name? Does it <clears> remain <throat> the same and it just gets shifted over? Right. So do you have to know all oh, that files now in Glacier? I got to or does AWS take care of that? So um, in the console, what I've seen is you have your bucket and on the side, some of, some of the attributes and sorry, I'm going to reiterate the question for anybody that's watching live. Uh, the question was, you know, I'm summing it up. How do you see what storage class it's in? Does Amazon manage that or do you know, need to know where to go to find that? Is that correct? Um, that's an attribute on the object. So if you look at the attributes in the S3 console or in the CLI data that you get back, it'll tell you what class it's in. So you'll look through and it may say standard, standard, and frequently accessed Glacier. So it will show you, it still looks like it's in the same bucket, it's still there, but the class in which it's being stored is different. Can we customize the routes so that, I mean, for example, like if the person doesn't come for 60 days, then delete it, something like that. So how to customize the... So you have some customization that you can do in the rules, and the, the question was, can you customize your lifecycle rules um, to better suit your scenario, correct? <coughs> yes, I believe that you can go, I don't remember if you can go straight from S3 to Glacier, but I do know that you can kind of cut back on your times. You may not even choose to put it in the Glacier before you delete, so you do have some flexibility of what life cycle rules you create. Good. Any more questions? All right. We're going to keep going. Um, versioning. So versioning is a, another service that S3 provides. It allows for multiple copies of an object to be stored as a version. So say that I have a file called hello.txt and I update that file. I might, you know, might just print out hello world and I might say uh, I want to update that and say hello Steve. And then I upload that to S3. It looks like there's only one object in there, but under the hood, there are multiple versions of that. And they are tagged with something called an e-tag, which is the, spe the version ID. And that's what specifies which version you have. So um, when you delete something, it doesn't actually delete. It adds a delete marker that, to remove it from your view. So if you're looking at your S3 uh, bucket, a file may not look like it's there, but if you turn <coughs> If you turn on the versions, you can see all the different versions of a file, and you can see the delete marker that is hiding that from view. So your files, when versioning is turned on, isn't actually gone. It's just hidden from view. Uh, this is at a bucket level. So you turn versioning on at a bucket level. And once it's turned on, it can be suspended, but it cannot be turned off. All versions created before uh, suspending will still remain. So let's switch over here real quick. Let's do a quick example for versioning just because this is an important thing. So say that I have a bucket. Um, we'll just call it test two. That's probably not globally unique, but run with it for the example. All right, so that we have a, a file called hello.txt and world.txt. And this is for versioning. So these two files exist in this bucket before we turn on versioning. Now we're going to turn versioning on. So this is after version. So we've turned versioning on, and now we're going to add, so we still have our hello and world text. And then let's put another file called me.txt. OK, so now we see we'll have a version ID. And this one will have an ID of 1. But these currently are nil, because it doesn't go back and retroactively fill version IDs for objects that are already in there. But now, say that I upload another copy of my world.txt. Now, it will have a version ID as well. And you can keep going. So if I did this again, we got two, three, four. But versioning IDs get, active, or get applied after 
a new version has been uploaded if the object was in the bucket before versioning was turned on. Now similarly, if you turned off versioning, these version IDs still remain. So now if I put in another file called you, it wouldn't get a version ID, but we're not losing the ones that are already there. If I did this one again? Yeah, after you, like, suspending the version. It should, I think it overrides the last version that was there, as far as I understand. That's a good question. <clears throat> Everybody follow? Question. When you say bucket, is that the very top level account? This bucket? is what we talked about with our root, like our root directory, and then we could have our uh, prefixes, which was like our folder structures. So you can't set it at the prefix level? Correct. So you couldn't have test to slash my folder. You couldn't apply it to this. You could you would apply it to your your root level and then anything under would be versioned. Question. So do you have to pay for a file that's in delete uh, status, I guess? So and that, that's a good question. The question was do you need to pay for files that are in a deleted status? The answer is yes, because these still exist in your bucket. They haven't actually gotten rid of anything, so you're still storing data, but it is no longer in view. So you're not uploading to uh, that new versions to that, but you're still paying for whatever you have in there. So if you have 10 versions <coughs> of a file, so if I put world.txt in there 10 times, I am paying for the 10 different versions of that file but it does help me to go back and version control what I had. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so at the end of this, you said that you could delete something, say, after so many days in Glacier. Mm -hmm. At what point can you stop paying for that file if you really don't ever want it again? So if you want to get rid of a file entirely, you would need to delete it and all of its versions. So you would need to go through and actually get rid of all the versions of that file as well. Now, if you wanted to get to a state where you wanted no versioning on your objects anymore, you would need to move those uh, objects over into a bucket that is not versioned. Question. <coughs> Clarify something. So before version, you added hello.txt. Yes. You turned on versioning. You added another hello.txt. So now it has version one. Uh, world. I did it for world, but yes. Whatever. Yeah. So, this there was no so there's no version ID for hello.txt because it was there before we okay. didn't apply it now there was none but now since I uploaded one then it gets the version ID after I've applied does after. it overwrite zero then or is there there is zero. none so there is no zero here this is just a, I, a null no. then it gets what the I'm version getting ID. then the world.txt which had no version correct because you didn't have versioning on. Correct. You turn it on, you upload another copy of world.txt, it's overwriting the existing world.txt, and there's no previous version. Do you, do you so it's just certain versions of Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <clears throat> I believe it does apply the versioning then, and then it applies this as the new version. So I'll, I'll dig into that a little bit. But from what I understand is, it, it's like it enables versioning now on that object because it would still see this as a version. So you're right, this original one should be zero. This new one is one, and it picks up that this is the latest copy. Good questions. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, so encryption. Uh, there are two kind of categories of encryption. There is encryption in transit uh, for Encryption in transit, you need to either use, or you need to use SSL or TLS. Um, also, by the way, based on feedback, uh, the links were or the uh, items were red. They are now yellow, so make it easier to see. So, if you see things in yellow now, those are the new uh, fill in the blanks. For encryption at rest, there are four different ways you can do that. You can do client side encryption, so encrypt your file before you upload it. You can use S3 managed keys, and that's kind of offloading the encryption load to the S3 bucket, or to S3 itself. You can use the key management service from Amazon called KMS. 
Uh, there's a lot more to that, but we're just going to kind of tell you know we're just going to mention that it's an option. It's not covered in depth in the developer exam. And then you can use customer provided keys. Uh, securing your buckets. There are two ways you can secure your buckets. You can use access control lists, and you can use bucket policies. So access control lists uh, grant access to users and AWS accounts, and it can be applied at both uh, bucket and object level. So you would go in and you could manage through the S3 console your access control lists. Your bucket policies, they're attached to the bucket only. Uh, they apply to all objects in the bucket, and it specifies what actions can be done to that bucket. These are very similar to your policies in, uh, in IAM. You write a policy, and that's what your bucket policies are, uh, the JSON-based policies that give permissions or deny permissions for the bucket that it's specified on. Static websites. Remember uh, for your dev exam that you can host static websites on S3. Why is this beneficial? It's beneficial because you can put basic websites out there that don't need server-side code and allow S3 to handle the traffic to it. So you don't need to worry about load balancing it, you don't need to worry about the amount of traffic going to it. S3 manages that for you. Um, bucket names must match the domain name. The provided bu you provide a bucket with an index.html and an error.html files. And then if you're using JavaScript, ensure that you disable cores on the bucket, otherwise your JavaScript code will not be able to execute. Uh, that will almost certainly be a question you guys get. Um, Remember that cores is how you, you disable cores to get your JavaScript code for your S3 static websites to work. Question. What is cores? Cross, so the question was what is cores? Cores is cross origin. Resource sharing. What is it? Resource, Resource sharing. Resource sharing, yeah, thank you. I didn't remember that off the top of my head. Um, I believe it's a JavaScript check that makes sure that the origin is a proper origin. Uh, if anybody says differently, let me know. I've not done a lot of job with JavaScript, I'll be honest, but yes, it is a feature of JavaScript that you need to make sure that you disable. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, Large-scale data transfer. So there are two services that provide that Amazon provides for large-scale data transfer, and they're shifting over to just it being one. Uh, some organizations have large, large amounts of data, petabytes, even potentially exabytes of data that they need to transfer and they want to transfer to the cloud. But data transfer over the wire would take several years. So how can they quickly get their <coughs> data up into S3? Well, Amazon used to have a service called AWS Import Export. This is where you could mail your hard drives to AWS and they would upload them into S3. This is a legacy service that's being phased out. You can't even find it in the console. Because what had happened is they got sent a bunch of different types of hard drives and all sorts of formats. Kind of a pain to manage. So they replaced it with a new service called Snowball. AWS Snowball. It is a hardware device that uploads files to Amazon and it will upload the contents to an S3 bucket. So you can order this device, and you can see it there in the gray. It is, uh, it's bigger than a briefcase, it's heavy, it's bulky. Um, it's not covered super deep in your exam, so we're just gonna high level cover it. But it is for petabit scale data transfer. There are three different flavors. There's a standard snowball, and that can move 80 terabytes. There's a Snowball Edge, which has some compute functionality, some Lambda functionality, that's 100 terabytes. And there is Snowmobile. And for the really big customers that need to move exabytes, they will ship you a semi-truck with a shipping container on it. And they will park outside your facility and run data lines in, and you will transfer your data to this truck. And they will drive it back to Amazon and upload your data to S3. Questions? Okay, CloudFront. CloudFront is a CDN. So CDNs are content delivery networks, and this is a, this is a service 
that caches objects in regions physically closer to customers. Okay, so we're going to switch over to the camera. All right, this is where my drawing skills come in. I'm not good at drawing. We're here to learn Amazon, not critique my drawing skills, so bear with me. So, let's say that we are hosting a website here in the US. I'm not good at drawing. Yeah, I know. And say that we all have customers in Africa that want to hit our service. Let's say South Africa. All right, so we have customers here in South Africa. That may not be the right place, but whatever. And we are hosting in, let's say, California. So here is our region. We may want, we may be hosting our images, videos, other content here in our S3 bucket in Northern Virginia. But to make this hop from South Africa all the way across takes a lot of time. It's a lot of distance to cover and the latency is probably not very good. So what is something that we could do in order to get faster data recovery for our customers closer to where they're at? These are edge locations. Edge locations are caching servers that are closer to your users, and I don't know if there's caching servers here or not, edge locations, but I do know that there are some in Europe, there are some all across the world. There are more edge locations than there are regions. And the, the point of these are just to cache your content to to get them closer. So I might have a region here. I might have ones here so that I upload from my origin, my S3 bucket, to my CDNs. And now when customers want to retrieve data from that, they first hit the edge locations, which are much closer to their physical location. And that also takes a load off. So if, this, if we used an uh, EC2 instead of an S3, them going to the edge locations for a cloud front actually diminishes the load on our EC2 instance as well because we're offloading some of that uh, data to the CDNs instead. So it, does it keep track automatically of when you change and it recaches? So we'll, we'll jump into that. Okay. Okay, so the components of CloudFront are our edge locations. So this is the location where content is cached. This is different than our availability zones and our regions. There are more edge locations than there are regions. Our origin, this is the source content cached on the edge location. So this could be an S3 bucket. This could be an EC2 instance. This could be a load balancer. This could be a Route 53. Our distribution, that is the name of the CDN which consists of one or more edge locations. So in our example, we had a set in Africa and we had one in uh, the US. Our distribution is the banner in which we, we specify what edge location we want. Uh, the two types of CDNs that you can have are web distributions. So this is webs, uh, website info, files, or you can have RTMP, which is media streaming. Um, there is a question about how does it know when to recache. Um, objects get cached with a TTL or a time to live. And once that expires <clears throat> or a user forces the object to be removed or in invalidated, then the uh, CDN will go back and recache from the origin that file. So far so good? Okay, uh, CloudFront is an important one to know but you don't need to know it super deep for the developer exam. So we are going to jump into EC2. EC2 is one of the largest topics on the exam. And let's, is there a show of hands? How many people have, have worked with EC2s? So most everybody. EC2, it's the Elastic Compute Cloud. So yesterday our videos didn't work. We're gonna try it again and let's give it a shot. Keep your fingers crossed. 
Whatever kind of application you run, it's pretty certain that you're going to need servers. Sometimes you might need larger ones, and sometimes you might need smaller ones. Sometimes you might not need many, and other times you might need tens or hundreds. Whatever your requirements, wouldn't it be great to be able to obtain servers quickly and inexpensively? Traditionally, obtaining servers could be quite time-consuming and typically something that could take weeks or even months. You have to do research into the right kind of hardware to buy, maybe get budget approval, and then purchase the hardware, have it racked and stacked, and eventually get access to your servers. And once you've purchased the servers, you are stuck with them. Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud, or Amazon EC2, makes it easy for you to obtain virtual servers, also known as compute instances, in the cloud quickly and inexpensively. You simply choose the instance type you want, the temperature you'd like to use, which could be based on Windows or Linux, and launch the quantity you need. You can do this with a few clicks from the AWS Management Console, or automate the process via an API using an SDK in your choice of language. Within minutes, your instances will be running, and you will have access with full administrative control, just like any other server. And with Amazon EC2, you pay only for what you use. When you're done using your instances, you stop them, and you stop paying for them. Amazon EC2 provides a range of instance types designed for different use cases. These range from small and economical instances that are a great choice for low-volume applications, all the way up to cluster computer instances designed for high-performance computing workloads and cloud-based supercomputing on demand. Amazon EC2 provides instances optimized for compute, memory, storage, and GPU processing to enable you to find the right price and performance combination for whatever workloads you want to run. It's also really easy to resize your instances if your business or application requirements change. Amazon EC2 offers a choice of flexible pricing options. With on-demand pricing, you pay only for what you use. When you stop your instances, you stop paying. There are no long-term commitments or upfront fees. Reserved instance pricing lets you obtain a significant discount over the on-demand price in return for a low one-time payment. Spot instance pricing lets you name the price you want to pay for instances using market-based pricing and can allow you to obtain compute capacity at a significant discount to the on-demand price. We know that security is very important for your applications and Amazon EC2 provides a number of built-in security features. Your instances are located in a virtual private cloud, or VPC, that is a logically isolated network that you control. Amazon VPC provides you with a number of network security tools you can use to control who can access your instances. You can also connect securely to your on-premises network with a hardware-based VPN device. Amazon EC2 instances provide you with various amounts of directly attached temporary storage depending on instance type. And you can also use Amazon Elastic Block Store, or EBS, to provide persistent block storage for your Amazon EC2 instances. Amazon EBS also offers you the ability to provision storage with a specific level of performance to meet the needs of your application. It can be difficult to predict the demand that your applications might experience, and Amazon EC2 provides auto-scaling to help ensure that your application's demands are met. Autoscaling lets you define metrics to increase or decrease the number of instances that you are running. You can choose standard metrics such as network bandwidth or CPU utilization, or a custom metric that you define. This helps you ensure that you can meet your application's demands without manual intervention and pay only for what you need. You can sign up for an AWS account today and get started with Amazon <coughs> EC2 in minutes. And with the AWS free tier, you can try cloud computing for free. All right, it's a high level of EC2. So what is EC2? It is an AWS provided service for virtual machines and associated technologies in the cloud. So they talked a little bit about things like auto scaling and uh, VPC. These are all tied in with EC2. So pricing models, uh, there's the on-demand pricing. So that's pay per hour for Windows and more recently, Linux has switched over to pay per I want to say it's second or minute. I, I believe it's actually minute, so this is wrong. I'll fix that. There are spot instances. Spot instances are uh, the ability to pay per current market value. So you place a bid, and if that, if your cost is at or below, above the bid point, you will get that instance until it reaches your threshold where you say, I'm not going to pay any more than X. 
reserved instances. This is prepaying for capacity to capitalize on discounts. So you have one or three year terms and you can go all the way up to 75% if with a, I believe it's upfront three year contract. And finally, there's dedicated hosts. These are reserved hardware, not multi-tenant hardware. So the others you could have on the same physical hardware, you could have other users um, through a, from AWS using those machines. Now they're isolated from yours, but they're on the same physical hardware. Sometimes you may have licensing issues or contracts that state that you have to have specialized dedicated hardware and dedicated hosts will do that for you. So you would be the only uh, user on that set of hardware. Instance types. You won't be tested on the types, but it is very important to understand that there are different types. Uh, you won't be tested on them for your developer exam, but you will be tested on this knowledge in the other exams. So if you go forward and do the solutions architect or the sysops or devops, expect that you need to know your instance types. So we're going to cover them pretty quickly. Uh, the types are to help you meet your specific need or scenario. So for instance, there's the T series. You may have heard of like T2, T2 micro. Uh, these are general purpose machines and they are what are called burstable, which means that if you don't expect to hit your max CPU all the time, then these are a good option for you. They allow you to burst lar or they allow you to burst your CPU for small amounts of time and then return down to a less uh, intensive workload. M are also general purpose. Think of them like your main instances. These are good for like web servers, um, basically utility boxes. These are kind of well-rounded machines. C, they're the compute optimized. So if you have a workload that is compute intensive, the C class is what you should be looking at. They're higher in processing power, uh, potentially lower in RAM and uh, storage. Your R, these are RAM intensive. If you need a lot of RAM for your application, the R series is what you should be looking at. If you have extreme RAM needs, look at your X series. If you need general purpose graphics, look at your P series. I think of that as pictures. Um, G for your graphic intensive. F are your field programmable gate arrays. And this is, this is an instance type that actually kind of lets you specify your hardware closer to your needs of your application. That's uh, really fairly new for that one. Um, your H series, which is your high storage optimized, so high disk throughput. I for IOPS, so input output per second. Um, these are, you need a lot of IO. And then D is data dense, so if you have a file server or something that needs to be very data dense, D, story, D series would be what you want to look at. So there are volume types that get attached to a EC2 instance. There is instance store. Instance store is the uh, older of the two and actually three now. Um, this is ephemeral storage. It means that if you stop your instance or you restart your instance, the data on that instance is lost. So if you were to restart your machine and you had uh, deployed a code package to it on an instance store volume, you will have lost that data. If you want persistent data, you'll, have, you'll use what's called elastic block storage, or EBS. This is the most common value, volume type. And think of it like a virtual hard drive that you would attach to your EC2 instance. Uh, each EBS volume can be mounted to only one EC2 at a time. So I could detach my EBS volume if I wanted from a machine and then reattach it to another, but it can only be attached to one single EC2 at a time. The types of EBS volumes you can have are magnetic, solid state, and provisioned IOPS. And the uh, main go-to anymore is the solid state. It's got good performance. The time you might use magnetic is if you had some sort of like file server. Uh, the magnetic is not used very often anymore. And then provisioned IOPS might be if you have a MySQL database that you're hosting yourself that you wanted to uh, you needed higher throughput, you may provision an, a uh, provisioned IOPS type EBS volume. Multiple uh, EBS volumes can be attached to a single instance, EC2 instance. So we have a one to many, one block to, so 
one EBS attached to a EC2, but an EC2 could have multiple EBSs. They can be encrypted, but only at creation time. And snapshots can be taken to back up and store EBS volumes. So say I have an instance, and let's look at the two last points. If I wanted to encrypt a volume that was not currently um, encrypted, I could take a snapshot of that EBS volume, and then when I create a new volume from it, I could encrypt that new volume. And then the third type, and this is fairly new, and this is EFS, and this is the Elastic File System. So we have a video. Lots of applications require shared file storage that can be accessed by multiple computers at the same time. But building your own file storage system takes time and can be very expensive. And once your file storage system is deployed and operational, you have to do complex maintenance and backup operations to make sure it's performing well and your data is secure. What if there was a better way? Amazon Elastic File System, or Amazon EFS, is a shared file system for use with Amazon EC2. With Amazon EFS, applications running on multiple EC2 instances can access your file system at the same time. And the service uses the industry standard NFS version 4 file access protocol, so the applications and tools that you use today work seamlessly. It's easy to create an Amazon EFS file system with a few clicks in the AWS Management Console, or by using the AWS SDK, or AWS command line interface. Once your file system is created, EC2 instances in your Amazon VPC can mount your file system and begin storing data in EFS. Amazon EFS manages all the infrastructure for you and automatically scales your file system storage capacity up or down as you add or remove files, ensuring you always have the storage you need while reducing time-consuming administration tasks. And with Amazon EFS, you only pay for the space your files and directories use. There is no minimum fee and no setup cost. Making sure your data is available and secure is really important. Amazon EFS is designed to be durable and highly available and automatically replicates your data across multiple availability zones in a region. Amazon EFS gives you the flexibility to control who can access your file systems and their content. Amazon VPC security groups and network access control lists allow you to manage network access to your Amazon EFS file systems. At the file and directory level, Amazon EFS supports user and group read, write, and execute permissions. And Amazon EFS is integrated with AWS Identity and Access Management to control access to Amazon EFS's administrative API. Amazon EFS lets you run applications that use shared file storage in the cloud and automates time-consuming storage administration tasks, freeing you to focus on your application and business. Getting started with Amazon EFS is simple. To learn more about Amazon Elastic File System, visit our website, and you can create your first file system in a few clicks. All right, EFS. Elastic File Storage System that can be shared across multiple EC2 instances. That's, that's kind of nice, honestly. So EBS volumes, that was can only be attached to one at a time. This frees you up to have it attached to multiple machines at a time. It's used with or in place of EBS in, or instance store volumes for hosting data on EC2 instances. It is the network file system file, network file system file system version 4, NFS v4, and you pay on demand, no pre-provisioning required. So with an EBS volume, when you create the volume, you need to know the size that you want. It may be, I may need 90 gigs. Let's say I need 90 gigs. I need to know that up front. But with EFS, I can just start loading data into my EFS and it will scale up for me. Uh, it's block based storage, so same thing with EBS. So let's jump back over to EC2 and let's talk about load balancers. Load balancers are a service that helps you to migrate load or to distribute load against multiple EC2 instances. Load balancers must be associated with at least two availability zones. 
and you can only have one SSL certification per load balancer. So if you have one where you may need multiples, you can use star certs but you can only have one SSL cert associated with a load balancer at a time. Instances attached to load balancers will be reported as in-service or out-of-service, so based on health checks, and we'll jump down into those. Um, based on, I feel like I missed a slide. Oh, nope, okay. Based on health checks, it will detect if it should route traffic to it or not. Health checks, they're used to ensure the integrity of an attached instance. Uh, if an instance fails a health check, it will be removed from service to the load balancer. So when you bring a new EC2 and you attach it to a load balancer, it will run against a health check. And if that health check passes, it now says, okay, I will accept and route traffic to this new instance. But if that health check at any point fails, it says, I can't trust that you will be able to handle the load that I give you I'm gonna take you out of the rotation. Some components of a health check are the ping protocol. So are we checking against HTTP? The ping port, what port do we wanna execute traffic on? So port 80, port 443, port pa excuse me. Um, the route address, so maybe it's slash API slash health check. That might be the endpoint that I'm checking my health check for. And that might just be a simple service that says, I'm okay. But it's something that the health check can look at and make sure that it gets a successful response. Uh, response timeout. So how long do I want uh, the time to be before an instance is considered unhealthy? The interval, the time to wait between checks. Unhealthy threshold, the number of attempts before declaring an instance unhealthy. And healthy threshold, number of attempts to declare an instance healthy. So load balancer types. There are three now, two of which you need to know about. Uh, the classic load balancer, it's been on AWS for a while. It's an Amazon component that conducts round robin routing of traffic to multiple EC2 instances. Uh, the ELB, or elastic load balancer, provides the DNS address to route traffic to. Users cannot get an IP of an, EBI, or an ELB, and that is important you will not get an IP address for your load balancers. Now that's a little di different with the network one, but we'll get there. Um, this routes traffic at layer four on the OSI model. And it's, this has been the standard one for Amazon for a while. The newest of the, the three, well, the, the newer migration of that one is the application load balancer. So AWS, Component, it's an AWS component that conducts round robin routing of traffic to one or more target groups based on the rules of the target group. So a target group is a group of EC2 instances or auto scaling groups that handle specific traffic based on routing rules. So let's real quickly go up here and let's explain this. So a classic load balancer, an ELB, you would have your ELB and it would say I have potentially four EC2 instances. So traffic comes in and it starts to round off. It's a one, next, 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 two, so on and so forth. So it's going to round robin between these instances the traffic gets gets. Now an application load balancer is a little bit different. And ALB will route to target groups. And under each of our, our target groups, it will round robin to our EC2s. And these can be based on the route we want to go. So let's say this is slash API slash V1 slash product. Products. So this might be slash API slash V1 one orders. 
And based on the route that we want to go to, it will route to a set of easy two instances. This is, uh, allows you to handle where you route your traffic better to the EC2 underneath. <coughs> so the target groups. ALBs pro also provide DNS addresses to route traffic. Users cannot get an IP of an ALB. This is layer 7. This is application layer um, load balancing. So on the OSI model. And this is the new preferred load balancer type. I do speculate at some point they're going to get rid of uh, the classic load balancers. <coughs> Question. <clears throat> Does the target group then act as an ELB underneath the ALB? Because it's routing yeah. <coughs> traffic. Very similarly, routing. yeah. It's, it's kind of like sub-routing. <coughs> so yes, it's kind of like how the classic was doing it and just round robining it. That's what the target groups will do. But the ALB says, I know that I want to push these this type of traffic to these types of EC2s. So it might be that uh, based on the target group, we could potentially have different um, images that we're having the instances on. And we want all of our traffic to come in through that um, ALB. Does that make sense? Uh, the final type of load balancer is the network load balancer. We're not gonna cover this one because it's not part, it's, it only came out a few months ago and you shouldn't see it on your exam. Um, but they are the only load balancer that provides a user with an IP address. I have a question. Yeah, question. So for your um, ELBs, if you only have two EC2s under there and health check fails, what happens? So the question was, if you have an ELB with two EC2 instances and a health check fails, what will happen? So the instance that fails the health check will be taken out of service. In this case, you would only be left with one load bound or one EC2 accepting traffic. So um, that kind of ties in now with what we're talking about here with auto scaling. Um, but yeah, if the health check fails, the load balancer will stop routing traffic to that instance. Now that's a good transit. Does that answer your question? Right, but if you're expecting, it doesn't sound like it's balancing anything anymore. Because they're going to one EC2 instance. You're right. Um, Oftentimes it's used with auto scaling here. Okay. So, so we're, yeah, we're we're gonna do it. Okay. Um, oftentimes, load balancers are used in tandem with a service called auto scaling or a component called auto scaling. And this is a tool to create, maintain, and remove instances based on demand and provide a configuration. So you create a launch configuration, and it is the configuration file used by an auto scaling group to bring up new instances. So this, uh, some of the attributes that it'll have is the AMI or the Amazon machine image. The instance type might be like a T2 micro. The name of the instance, the IAM role to be associated with it. User data, user data is like a bootstrapping script that you can put on an instance. Uh, whether or not to assign a public IP address. What type of storage, so EBS volume instance store. And the security groups that should be um, applied to that instance. So load balancers and auto scale groups work together because the auto scale group can register with the health checks of the load balancer. So in the scenario where you have an ELB with two instances and one of the health check fails, it would now take that instance out of service and it would start routing to the new or to the single instance. At the same time, the auto scale group should register that that is not a healthy instance any longer. It will remove it and recreate a new instance to replace that instance. Everybody follow? Okay. So very often ELBs and auto scale groups are used for that very reason. Is uh, you'll hear auto scaling groups used with the terminology uh, self healing or auto healing, and it's it's the check that says I am no longer healthy. I'm going to remove it and I'm going to create a new one that should be. Um, some additional information about EC2 is images can be taken, and they're called Amazon Machine Images or AMIs. User data is either a Bash or PowerShell script for bootstrapping an instance. So you may want to pre-install Apache, or you may want to pre-configure your instance. You can write PowerShell or Bash scripts and have them run on startup of the instance. 
uh, instance data service, and remember these IPs. Uh, service data hosted on EC2s that allow users access information about the instance. So if you're on an EC2 instance and you want to get data about that instance itself, you can go to 169.254.169.254 slash latest slash user data for your user data or metadata. And this is a service that Amazon provides built into the uh, EC2s to help you get information about that instance. And the way I remember it is low, high, low, high. So 169.254, 169.254. Okay, so we have gotten through a lot today. Um, we got about two minutes left. Do we have any questions? Yes. Back on the uh, load balancers, do we need to know what the difference between layer four and layer seven of the OSI is? Very high level. It's I, uh, in the back of your packets. There is a reference guide, and there's a bunch of links on there that I've used. I have a link in there for the OSI model. You can take a look at, but it's kind of it's important to understand that like classical load balancers are managing at the TCP level and that the application load balancers are actually handling at the application level. So like a, a ELB uh, opposed to an ALB will route traffic based on the um, port more than the content, whereas the ALBs will read where is it supposed to be going. Does that make sense? Yeah. Question. So in terms of cost, I'm assuming like if you wanted to do S3 versus like the EF, was it EFS, the plastic cost. Is that like where you might transition at some point? Like if you started out, say, with a static website and then if you got more dynamic, you might be forced to go over here. So I'm assuming that EC2 is going to be a lot more money than the S3 would be right here. So the question was is kind of, and tell me if this sounds right, um, how do you kind of migrate over from S3 to EC2 and how does that look on a pricing standpoint for specifically websites? Um, the S3 websites are a great way to get kind of started up and get out there and be able to just mess with it a little bit. But yes, if you wanted to transition over to an EC2 instance to so say your application now needs the ability to run server-side code, you'd have to run on an a, um, EC2 instance. And EC2 instances are going to cost substantially higher than your uh, S3 or S3 object storage. Now, don't confuse S3 storage and EC2 storage because S3 storage is object-based storage, and EC2 storage, so EBS, is block-based storage. So you can store files and um, content like videos, images that can be stored just fine on a uh, S3. But you can't host uh, like a MySQL. You can't host your operating system on S3. That is where your block storage comes in, and the block storage can store all of that. So, does that make sense? Any other questions? Going once, twice. All right. Thank you, everybody.